So a few caveats before I start. Apologies for the, the, the warmth in the room, but um, this, this deck was kind of cobbled together a little bit in last minute, so if I stumble through some of this content or, or miss kind of speak over some of the slides, my apologies in advance. It's quite high level, so it's kind of, um, I guess, my, I, I do have a technical background, but most of my work in recent years has been away from technology to a certain extent, so I've been a little bit more leaning towards the commercial side of stuff. Um, but I've been involved in, in security or kind of very focused on security for about five years or so. Um, and this is the, the deck originally was put together um, to try and, and create some awareness within a company that I've been doing a bit of consultancy for for the last year and a half. Uh, it's a genomics company. So I'm going to talk a little bit about genomics. Uh, anybody in the bioinformatics space or genomics space or familiar? No. Um, if I talk too fast, I also I apologize for that. But, uh, it's a tendency to talk quite quickly where I'm from. Do you more English than Irish? I could slow down and put on an accent if that helps. Dutch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not there yet. Um, so it's it's kind of a mix of, of kind of how some of the things that um, some of the very sort of basic stuff that uh, I needed to kind of bring to bear to to raise awareness of security within the organisation. Um, and uh, so about me. So that's the, the title. Oh, I may have to. Okay. So my background. Um, I'm 20 years in the software space and about 12 years in, in IT security. I'm based in Dublin and Ireland. I'm w currently wearing a couple of different hats, so I'm, I'm trying to keep myself nicely confused and, and busy with, with a couple of different uh, initiatives and, and activities. Um, but uh, the bulk of my work within the security space has been uh, focused on uh, working for vendors and helping I hate using this word, but it kind of says things roundly enough to evangelize their solutions into, into organizations. So part of a pre-sales team or part of a sales team. Um, and uh, so I, I, I had similar roles uh, doing sort of pre-sales activities, going in, you know, setting up te the technology, running it again against websites, seeing if we can find anything interesting and create a compelling, compelling event for, for the customer to maybe consider purchasing that software. And that's kind of the goal, really, of, of a solutions architect or pre-sales engineer. So I've done that with a company called White Hat. I was with them for about five years, uh, first on the ground in region for them. Um, they pretty much packed up and went home, and the, most of their most of their activity is out of the U.S. now, unfortunately. Also with IBM, I was part of a company called Watchfire, which was acquired into IBM back in 07, I think it was. Um, Watchfire, uh, those of you who might be familiar with AppScan, the product that Watchfire developed. It was the first, first commercially available uh, web application scanner. Um, it it was quite a good tool in its day, but it started to kind of lose focus within when it got acquired by IBM. As often happens, anybody here worked for IBM before I insult them? You can just <laughs> burn, burn them. Okay, yeah, so uh, yeah, um, IBM is kind of like the place where good software goes to die, and uh, and that was my experience when when joining joining IBM from Watchfire. Now, I'm not saying Watchfire tools was, was sort of um, you know uh, what was necessarily uh, the, the absolute best of breed, but it was still a good technology. Nonetheless. So more recently, I've been focused on uh, working with, with Genomics Medicine Ireland. Um, so that I, I started working with them about a year and a half ago, like I said. Um, I started out, out doing security, security architecture review uh, and kind of looking at uh, their, their security posture and uh, aligning that with um, the NIST framework, which a lot of consultants tend to use when they're, they're going in to help organizations understand how to manage and their assets and, and have the right controls in place and so on. Um, and I'm still there uh, and more. I've kind of shifted gears a little bit. I now uh, um, report into the chief science officer who's one of the founders of the organization. Uh, and I, I'll talk a little bit about what they do and why security is important in the context of, of, of um, their activities. Uh, I also kind of will touch on a little bit uh, in um, digital transformation. So taking what they're doing at the uh, taking the data that they're generating from their activities and how they, they manage it and, and some of the security concerns around, around that data and, and the sizes. And it's it very much is big data that they deal with. Um, and, and also, uh, because I wasn't busy enough, I got involved in setting up a, a security distributor in Ireland as well. So uh, a guy I know has set something up in the UK, so I kind of represent their company in Ireland. Now, I'm not going to pitch any products, but it's a, a distributor, so they, we have a bunch of different vendors that we help um, with channels to market within within EMEA. Um, 
reason why I'm not displaying this on full screen and you can't read any of the text. <laughs> Yeah, so um, yeah, this is not ideal because I ultimately wanted to be able to It's not the most modern B1, so it's not this one. Well. Yeah. Okay. It's okay, so. You sure? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, because. Um, <coughs> okay. Uh, let's see if we go fight. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about genomics. Does anybody know what genomics or a genome is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is, I mean, the, okay, the other thing I got plates about from Martin was he got too much text in the slides. But uh, I, tend to, I tend to do that because if I'm not saying something is interesting, at least it might be something on the slide that you find interesting. Um, so there's a list of stuff here that really it kind of explains what a genome is. Um, and I'm not a bioinformatician, so I, I don't come from that background, um, I, and I'm still learning a lot about this. But uh, basically, it is uh, it's everything that refers to your DNA, so everything in your cells, your your makeup. Um, and this is taken from the website, the Gen uh, genome uh, genomics medicine Ireland website, which gives a kind of a rundown on specifically, uh, well, at, at a high level, what it's used for. But ultimately what GMI are doing is they have a remit. There's about six million people on the island of Ireland. Um, they are tasked with or tasking themselves with capturing 10% um, of the population of, of the island um, to enable them to do genetic analysis of that uh, gene pool. Or, or, and by generating data from, <clears throat> from blood samples, basically, uh, in order to help them identify gene targets for cures for, for different types of diseases. Okay, that's what they're doing. Um, they're kind of reasonably far down the line with that. Now, as, as part of that, obviously, they're generating quite a lot of data. The data kind of looks like this, believe it or not. It's, it's, a lot of it is, is text file format, and uh, there's uh, you know, four letters, and each one of these kind of represents the location of the gene. Um, and they're, they're tasked with kind of identifying where specific genes are based on patterns and so forth within within. Uh, the, the, the files that get generated out. If you were to generate out all data from your from a blood sample, it would be about represent about four hundred gigabytes bits gigabytes, excuse me, on, on disk per person. Um, so there's a big sort of focus from within GMI on, on a number of different things as a result of security of that data because it's kind of core to the human. It is your your genetic makeup. Um, how to control that and introduce controls around that data. How to how to move it around. So once you generate it and put it on disk, it's large, um, and uh, there are lots of challenges in, in moving it around. How to analyze it quickly. So we're looking at, uh, so there's a bunch of things I've been looking at. Machine learning, of course, uh, uh, high-performance compute, um, encryption protocols for, for, the, for the data types, uh, and so on, all with a view to uh, managing the privacy and, and security of the data, but also enabling it and, and being able to kind of use, make, keep it usable, but, but, but secure at the same time, right? Um, so, um, yeah. I'm going to stick on. I'll see that back. That's good. Are you sure? Yeah. Um, so, it's, it's a pretty simple process. Uh, how they, and I thought this might be interesting too if you don't know anything about uh, genomics and how, how an organization goes about capturing that data or generating that data. Um, so, basically, you, you offer up a blood sample, it's put through one of these machines. And you get this, this VCF file format. It's quite a large text file. Um, it, it typically has about a million plus lines of, of text. Uh, and the guys have a bunch of tools and scripts and stuff like that that they use to, to analyze the data. Um, and we're working on, on, on uh, developing kind of uh, more complex analytics techniques for that data as well, alongside uh, trying to capture and collect, collect uh, the, the, uh, the, the samples themselves. Now, as, as you can probably appreciate, there's a bunch of compliance uh, issues around handling this type of data, um, <coughs> and GDPR obviously kicks in, um, and there's there's certain, actually GDPR is quite good in a, it does actually make reference to this type of data, so it's considered PII, and there's a reference to genetic, uh, biologically kind of developed data, and there's two ways that GDPR says you need to, to handle that data, um, either you anonymize it, so which basically means you remove any identifiers that would enable you, if you got access to that data, to, to link it back to the person you took <coughs> the data from, or the sample from. Um, but if you anonymize data, 
you can't really use it because you're stripping out some of the the, uh, the markers in there that enable you to to um, generate good and uh, good results from your analysis. <coughs> um, so typically in genomics, what uh, organizations do is they pseudonymize or pseudo anonymize. Pseudonymization is, is, is the technique. Um, and what that does is, is, in effect, and what we've done in GMI is you, when you're capturing the data, you assign that sample a number. And that's what travels with the data from there on. So you're able to track it through, through the different, different uh, analysis activities. Um, that being said, there are still a bunch of concerns. And when you talk to some of the bioinformatics guys and some of the guys who work in health, um, ethics are, are a big concern for them. So they want to be sure that they're doing as much as they possibly can to control that data. Um, and uh, so one of the tasks I kind of took on board was to look at different techniques to encrypt it. Um, so the, the current state of the art is probably what everyone else is using is sort of you, you encrypt at rest, you encrypt in transit. Um, and that's basically what they're doing. It's, it's hard to, to introduce any other uh, controls or, or protocols into that process without making it very hard to, to work with. Um, however, you know, there, there, are, there is research being done in the state. Anybody familiar with homomorphic encryption or yeah. multi-party company? Yeah, okay. So I'll get on to some of, the, some of that. And, uh, um, but meanwhile, um, in the context of doing that, the organization itself is, is kind of in a constant sort of transformational stage. And um, I, know, I don't know, I mean, you guys might have a different view of what digital transformation is or means. Uh, some people, it's a bit of a nonsense term, it doesn't really mean a whole lot. Um, does it refer to, you know, is it simply just at this stage in, 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 in technology's sort of progress? Is it, is it APIs and, and algorithms and, and not much else? Um, or, you know, I think unless you're, you're, you're a complete Luddite or not engaged with technology at all, I'd say to most people, digital transformation is probably kind of stuff not other stuff into the cloud or something like that, just kind of changing how technology is used within your organization. So that's like to an individual or to you or me, that's maybe how you perceive it within an organization. Obviously, um, there's lots of benefits from um, uh, from doing this. Uh, you know, added value, it being able to add different types of services to your customer base, broadening your customer base, getting access to different global customers, for example. Um, you know, developing different types of lines of business or software as a service and so on. But of course, when you start to transform the business, you're going to have to change your security models along with it to accommodate. And um, that's one of the things that we're, we're seeing within, within GMI, um, for example. Um, however, uh, that's not necessarily a negative thing. Um, security, in certainly in the context of, of what GMI does, is seen to a certain extent as an enabler. So being able to show that you're controlling that data when you're engaging with subjects, you're in, in, engaging with clinicians, uh, it, it actually eases the path to allow them to work with you. And rather than, than against you, if you can reassure them that you're, you're controlling the data uh, as, 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 as strongly as you possibly can. Um, so yeah, we've been looking at a, different, a few different approaches. Um, you know, we, know, we all know these, these are kind of old Microsoft 10 immutable laws of, of, of security. It goes back, uh, back to 2011. Uh, you can't read them until I change the color. Does everybody know these? They're pretty basic, like, but um, yeah, so basically, um, you know, if anybody, if somebody can get access onto your system and so forth, um, you're, you're game over to a certain extent. Extent, but I mean, some of these still ring true today. Uh, these were published originally, I think, a few years before 2011, um, but they st still ring true. And the reason I included this stuff in is not for your benefit, because I assume most of you are security people. But uh, Again, this, is, this deck was, was uh, originally designed to kind of pitch to people who don't know anything about security. And this is one of the things that I think is important when you're trying to build or create awareness in an organization or build a culture of security is to kind of make it simple, stupid. You know, just kind of put some of this stuff around, make, make sure people are aware of these, these types of things, the implications of some of the activities that they, they might be conducting or, or not. Um, and, you know, once you start to kind of create awareness in an organization, you're probably going to start scaring people. And those people are probably going to start looking for solutions. And if any of you have been to a trade show, <laughs> I, I think this is nice, but Christ, it's, it's busy, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and recently I went to InfoSec in London. I don't know if any of you have been to that event. It's quite a large trade show. Yeah. Um, the one thing that strikes me every year um, is 
I, I struggle to figure out what most of the vendors do. <laughs> I really, yeah, exactly, yeah. They all look like they're doing pretty much the same thing. Um, so it's very hard for them to differentiate yourself. So if, you, if, if it's hard for somebody who's been in the security space for a number of years, I'm not saying I'm an, ex, I'm an expert on everything, but you know, think of it as, as a non particularly well versed security person who's trying to navigate this stuff. Um, so quite often, you know, raising awareness is not about scaring people, but uh, you know, and this is really the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's there's stuff that for for things that you didn't even realize needed security controls. You know, um, IoT is probably uh, uh, leading for at the forefront of that. Um, so a little bit flipping from Bruce Schneier. I'm sure you've seen this quote before. Um, it's not about you know. It's not necessarily about just kind of buying stuff off the shelf and, and, and chucking it at your environment and hoping you know you can plug it all together and it'll, suddenly you're secure. Obviously, that's not going to happen. Uh, it's not. A, it's not. It's, you're going to waste a lot of money. You're going to waste a lot of time, effort, and energy, and probably not get very far. So, while there's some truth in this, uh, there's you know in, in the way he's kind of put this. At the same time, if you know that the solutions that you're if you're sort of well versed, I, I, I guess you can make technology work for you, but don't expect to be able to just kind of plug your plug and play your way out of a problem. Um, I think that's 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 true. I mean, at a basic level. I'm going to do this very slowly. Um, do the yeah, I know where everything is now. Marco. So, <laughs> so I mean, at a basic level, if you're not kind of, you know, again, this is awareness stuff, so it's um, uh, it's, cool. it's fairly remedial. If you're not doing at a minimum. You're not doing some of this stuff just to kind of get off the ground. You know, you, you have some more problems than than you realize. But this is this is. I mean, I've looked online for, for, for guidance on, you know, where should you start? You know, what are the things that you really should be kind of beginning with? Um, and at a minimum, you know, know what your attack surface looks like. Make sure you're patching and configuring things properly. Uh, logs, quite useful. You know, analyze them. Uh, and then start from there. Build off the back of that baseline. And you, then you can kind of sp you can sp spread your wings into looking at different types of more complex frameworks. Um, and a lot of that is easy. It should be relatively easy to communicate back down to your IT teams who are not necessarily, you know, security aware either. So this is kind of a mixed audience type tech. You know, it's not just for you know, ordinary employees, but also some of the IT folks. Um, so if we come back to uh, the digital transformation angle, and um, you know, there's a huge adoption of a huge move to adopt uh, cloud, whether you agree with it or not. Um, um, and, you know, with that then, we have IT or security teams kind of you know, trying to trying to protect that environment, whether it's on-prem or hybrid or cloud, or, you know, fully committed to cloud. Um, now, as we know, uh, you know, uh, there are breaches still happening. Um, there are still, you know, the more complexity that you introduce potentially is going to introduce uh, or, or make the environment uh, harder to, to control. And, and, I, and then your cloud is, is, is obviously going to become a, a target for attackers. So that's what, I guess, digital transformation is, is potentially leading organizations towards. In some cases, it is, for sure, uh, having that effect. Anybody work with a cloud provider in the audience? Yeah? All of you? No? None of you? No yeah, AWS or Azure or some? Yeah. Some? Yeah. 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 I'm not trying to beat cloud up, by the way, so just don't take it the wrong way. But, uh, um, yeah. There's, uh, for if you want to change the, the color, if you click the text, and then you see, uh, you uh, see this uh, at the center, there's a text thing. And on the right side, it's a tab. So the tab, the tab. Yes. That yeah. That's there. You uh, well, there's this small uh, 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 right. rainbow that you click on to change the color. Yeah. But there's a white square next to it, a white rectangle next to it, and that that you can click to, and it will also change color where you select it. And that oh, okay. would be much easier, I think. Maybe if I just do the whole lot. <laughs> Maybe if I select the whole lot, yeah. I can change. But I don't want to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. No so, one of the things that we got concerned about in uh, when using cloud, so GMI, for example, is, it uses AWS, um, and 
one of the things that we kind of noticed and realized was that, so this is, again, this kind of comes back to working with uh, bioinformaticians and, and uh, medics and folks like that who are hypersensitive to managing data. And uh, they want to be sure, you know, they're able to tell their community that they're doing their utmost to, to uh, protect that data. Uh, so we were kind of digging around and, and looking at, at, at the setup uh, with, with, on AWS. And, and one of the things that we typically tend to see is that, you know, you can, you can address encryption in transit. Uh, you can typically address encryption that when the data is at rest. Um, if you want, you can put your keys into the cloud or not. Um, but one of the, one of the kind of concerns that our, uh, some of the team had was that, um, when the day, if you decrypt on the cloud, you don't have control of that asset necessarily. So in theory, um, typically that hole is not addressed by cloud providers. And we wanted to make sure that, you know, even if, if there was a, a facility in place to control when the data is in use in the cloud, which in theory then the server should be able to see that data when it's decrypted. Um, you, more often than not, what we try and do is, is take the data down from the cloud, decrypt locally so it's contained there. But you know, um, sometimes that doesn't always happen. Uh, so that's really one of the drivers about okay, how do we how do we find a better way to handle this data in an encrypted form uh, while it's and, and and we can put it wherever we like and we don't have to cons be concerned about whether it's it's in the clear or not or, or, or we don't have to be concerned because it'll never be in the clear. Um, so that kind of led us on to taking a look at um, uh, different encryption protocols. So again, if we go back uh, to Talking about um, why you know so what you know the data is pseudonymized. So even if it was accessed, you know what are you going to be able to do with it? And this is one of the other kind of pushbacks we get, and particularly with the IT team when we're telling them, you know that thing about the data when it's on the server and you decrypt it up there and you can sit in the clear and you know, we're concerned with that. And then we, we usually get this, yeah, so what though? You know, it's pseudonymized. It's not really usable data. Um, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, you won't be able to ever take that data and, and link it back to the subject that it was taken from. Um, and after all, DNA or genetic data is PII. It's about as PII as you can get. Um, GDPR, like I said, makes reference to it. Uh, so, and like I said, again, I kind of jumped ahead here. Anonymization um, makes the data unusable. So, so right now, the only way we can deal with it is, is by pseudonymizing it. Um, so we... One of the areas that we then started to have a, a take a closer look at is, well, all right, if, if the data is pseudonymized, um, and say, say the IT guys who we're talking to think, yeah, well, it, maybe it is unusable in that format. Um, are they right? You know, can you, I mean, if, even if you did get access to that data, could you, would you be able to identify back to that person where you originally take, had taken it from? And the answer is yes, based on some research that we, we dug up. Um, there was a chap called Yamid Ehrlich, I think his name is, this, this gentleman here, um, who uh, basically did this. He was able to recover surnames and families from publicly available data and track, so take that data and, and correlate it back to families in a, in a particular location without knowing who they were. Um, And that will be that will be easier over time, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. It's all right. Have a seat. So yeah, I mean, we were getting sort of pushback from this, from some of the guys, and they were telling us that it will, you know, irrespective, we've kind of separate made that separation. We, we encrypted, and we, we encrypted that rest and in transit. So we're doing as much as we can. Um, so we, we, like I said, we then started to take a closer look at this, and we found this guy who's, who's been doing quite a lot of research into genome hacking is, is basically a way of terming it. And uh, there is a way, and I'm not a, again, I'm not a geneticist, so there's a, this kind of talks to specifically what you need to do in order to be able to take publicly available genetic data and get right back to a surname from that data without actually knowing the name, you're, you're having any real, any, any real identifier of that individual. So consequently, we were getting more and more concerned, and uh, we thought, wait, <laughs> no, 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 we have, no, I'm joking, I'm joking. Uh, no, blockchain is not the answer. Um, so we had a look around at, at different protocols, um, um, 
Oh, I had to stick that in there for Martin because we were at a, a blockchain conference. Uh, so yeah, I, there, there were, there's a bunch of different techniques that we looked at where, so how can we encrypt data and run analysis on that data without ever necessarily decrypting? Still leverage the computer of the cloud right? because you want to use that in the scale. Exactly. That's a big yeah. Problem, yeah, yeah. There's two things that we looked at as well, in, in, and it's interesting that you mentioned that because that's kind of your you're getting into the the the, the, the area of scalability and, yeah. and sort of high performance compute and, and elasticity as well. So yeah. using it when you need it, sort of thing. Yeah. yeah so um, the three three areas that we looked at. Anybody familiar? I think you mentioned you were familiar with this stuff. Um, I didn't know much about this when I started looking at, at these different uh, types of approaches. Um, Intel SDX is 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 basically a secure enclave on on a, on a processor. So as you may know it's in your iPhones. It's, it's used in Signal as well uh, for their address lookup and stuff like that. Um, we we haven't really re revisited this yet, but it, it, it may be something that's that's feasible to work with, although as far as we know, it's susceptible to side channel attacks as well, so it does leak information when you're accessing the memory. Um, and I think they've got a workaround for that, but I can't remember, can't recall what it is. Uh, homomorphic encryption is kind of cool, and um, if you don't know anything about homomorphic encryption, um, it's still somewhat theoretical, although we did come across a team, anybody familiar with Leuven, uh, Kozik and Leuven? You know the team there. Uh, so we had quite a bit of interaction with, with some of the folks there. In particular, two girls who developed. Um, so GWAS is, is genome-wide association study. It's the type of approach you take if, you're, if you've got a whole bunch of genomic, genomic data and you're trying to associate them, funny enough. So you're trying to do analytics across a bunch of data sets or data types or genome uh, data. And there were two girls there who uh, built working prototypes to uh, leverage both homomorphic encryption and multi-party multi, multi uh, party computation in the context of the GWAS study. And they've kind of mapped it out. I can share the link if anyone's interested in, in, in looking through it. It's quite interesting. And, and they gave us the code and stuff to play with. So uh, some of the guys had a look at it and, and got it working. Um, and the only drawback with... So it, as you are probably aware, of crypt cryptography is basically high-end mathematics and, and being able to sort of deal with data through, through math mathematical theorems and, and so forth. And... Um, there's a huge amount of mathematics gone into this. And there's a whole bunch of open source libraries that they use um, as part of the protocol. Um, and homomorphic encryption in itself, uh, there, there are a bunch of drawbacks. Uh, in particular with homomorphic encryption, you're kind of restricted somewhat to certain types of operations. It's good for very simple operations, but once you get into complexity, it gets really slow. Um, and also the data size is huge because you're encrypting at the same time. And so there's still some challenges there with that. But to your point about uh, scalability and using large compute, uh, there's a lot of kind of talk around introducing high performance capabilities to, to enable you to work with data that's in, 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 in that trans, that's transformed into homomorphic kind of state. Um, there's actually some research being done around doing that in the context of artificial intelligence as well, which is interesting. But so that's not really usable. Um, it can be used as part of, of a sort of a, a protocol. So you might combine that and get and homomorphically do some operations on your data, but you probably won't be able to build an entire protocol with it. Um, the one that's more promising, and we've seen some, there are some companies that have launched in the last few years that are offering enterprise ready um, multi-party computation uh, capability. And um, that's probably the most flexible. Um, it's certainly probably, the, and it looks like probably the easiest to deploy. Um, I would encourage you to look at this stuff though. So these are the two models. Unfortunately, the, the um, resolution isn't great, but uh, we're probably going to take a bit of a closer look at the multi-party approach over the, over the coming months. We haven't done anything baked just yet, but certainly the, the, the proof of concept works well, um, and uh, we don't like what those girls were doing. But they're just some of the, the encryption activities that we've been researching. Um, so back to uh, security culture. Um, yeah, I almost feel embarrassed kind of talking through some of this stuff with you guys, but I'll talk through it nonetheless. Um, so, uh, and again, this might be helpful, I suppose, if you're having to do this internally with, within your organization, you're trying to raise awareness of security. You know, as you know, the more stuff you put online, the bigger your attack surface gets. <coughs> That's the reason. Um, Cybersecurity is not just the security team's responsibility. Everybody in the organization needs to, to embrace it and understand it and be aware. Um, but it, it, it's... We often see that it needs to be kind of trickled down, top down. You know, your leadership needs to be very much invested in it. And, and um, uh, 
one of the things as well, I suppose, during my career when I started out in in security and going into organizations who weren't very familiar with the space, am I okay for time? Yeah. Okay. Um, I still got probably a thirty slides. Yeah, yeah. I'm joking. I'm going to tell you. When you're <laughs> yeah. <open>. Um, so <laughs> so you will notice. <laughs> yeah, you tell me. Um, so one of the things I noticed when I started out was resistance in organizations when you go in and you start telling them they've got problems that they didn't realize they had or they've built an application that they're very very proud of and you start poking holes in it. You know, it's the kind of baby ugly syndrome. You know that sort of thing. So um, and that's still. Still, it's still true today, right? So, um, whenever you're kind of trying to build a culture, a security culture, or, 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 or generate awareness, you need to be conscious of, of not sort of apportioning blame. Um, it's really about sort of risk management. Um, so, if you can almost translate it into non technical terms, it, it kind of helps. Um, uh, and so on. We know it's complex, um, but it's, it's good if the organization and people within the organization understand the implications of. Of experiencing a breach, um, and usually it's people who cause most of the problems, rather than the technology. You know, we've seen that often enough. So they're harder to control than than, than your technology more more often than not. Uh, so yeah, this kind of goes back then to uh, my. So this is a company I originally started working in security for. I found this website on. Uh, yeah. webarchive.org and uh, I dug out this that page which is kind of interesting it's just kind of I was reminiscing and making me feel reminiscent about it so back in 2007 but again to, to my point it was working with these guys they they were winning all sorts of awards I thought they were the greatest security team in the world until you know I started to learn more and, and get more mature in the space and, and realize that you know, it's not all about technology. Uh, their scanners were good, but you you kind of got what out of them, what you put in, um, and and eventually they got acquired. And, and like I said earlier, uh, the rest is history. They, they moved into IBM. So often when you're going into organizations, you're kind of you're dealing with. I was trying to find a way of, of kind of um, of kind of talking about you know, the, the typical stages of of. of uh, Resistance that you get within an organization when you're trying to teach them about security. So if you're familiar with the five stages of grief, uh, there's kind of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Uh, and they're typically the if, if, even if I'm trying to get a deal done in an organization to sell some security, I'm, I'm probably cycling through all these different stages in order to get to the point where they go, okay, you know, I'm happy to to, to work with the technology that you're that you're positioning with us. So. Um, Denial. Of course, nobody has any vulnerabilities, and nobody really gives a shit either, right? So, if anyone's familiar with Jurassic Park, it's kind of, yeah, vulnerabilities, we don't have any, so nobody cares. So, often you go in and you, you start telling folks about the stuff that they have, you know, they have issues with. Uh, and they kind of shrug and they, yeah, we don't really, don't really care. I think that attitude is changing, but it's still... It still happens from time to time, but certainly in the early days when I was engaged with it, um, it was true. Um, and, and then anger. You know, how dare you suggest that we might have problems? We spent, you know, lots of money trying to comply with various different regulations, and now we're secure. Of course we're secure because we comply with GDPR like that as a, as a representation of GDPR. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're not going to get secure just by following a compliance regulation. You know, uh, it's silly to think otherwise. I mean, if you look at GDPR, it's, it's very lightweight. Doesn't tell you specific controls that you need to implement and so forth. It talks certain things, but and I like it. I do like GDPR. It's certainly making more and more people aware of of security, and companies are taking it more seriously because there's a fa financial penalties rather than anything else. I would suggest. Um, so that's anger, and then we can move on to bargaining. You know, it'll never happen to us. But of course, again, we know it happens frequently, and, and the more, every time I look at this, you're probably familiar with this. Uh, um, website where you can kind of get a visualization of all the breaches. This just gets more and more busy. If you go down further back into the early days of when it was originally um, put together, I think 2010, there's a kind of a scattering of breaches, and then as you move up the years, it starts to get very busy. So now you can you can hardly make out uh, which breach is which, but uh, you know they're, we know they're ha happening all the time, um, and motivations vary. 
Um, I think a lot of people are, you know, get concerned, and, and maybe there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, doubt put into organizations when by maybe the media, maybe by certain security professionals. We talk about organized crime, nation states, terrorists, they kind of dig it up a bit, industrial espionage. And they're all valid concerns, but quite often, more often than not, it's your employees that are going to cause the most issues. So motivations uh, vary, and it's that kind of realization that this is what you're kind of up against um, that I think then starts to, to kind of help organizations move into the acceptance phase. Unfortunately, you can't see that, but um, you know, I, I can't even remember what it is. It's somebody saying your server is fucked or something. Yeah, so, yeah, so motivation, and we know the motivations can be varied. Um, and, yeah, and, you know, and things are hackable, right? Um, and one of the, you know, there's another thing that's interested me in recent, I think again, media calling, you know, when, when something, when, when cybercrime is perpetrated, immediately it's hackers who've done this. Yeah. That's not true. You know, um, I think people who hack are doing it out of curiosity and various other things and quite more often than not rather than, than for financial gain. So I think that, that the, unfortunately, the term hack has, hacker has been, been misused over the years. Um, and that's for me, uh, again, if you understand where this deck or why this deck was put together was to kind of help or, uh, people in an organization understand what hacking is about. I don't know if that, that makes sense to you guys, but it was the best sort of description I could find at the time. Um, and target verticals, we know most verticals are targeted. Common vectors, for those of you who don't know, and I think this is from the data breach incident report, so Verizon's report. You know, whatever industry you're in, these are typically what you'll see from a, um, a vector perspective, you know, or a combination of, of these. Uh, we were talking about DDoS earlier on and stuff like that, but um, you know, these are not hacker activities really. Malware and ransomware is not sort of hacker activities. Uh, phishing, social engineering, that sort of thing, it's not really hacking. Um, it's more about crime. Healthcare, of course, is a focus vertical. Healthcare, in, in certainly last year and in recent years, has been seen as an easy target. Um, and uh, they really have a lot of work to do to, to secure their, their, their infrastructure. NHS in particular, which is the UK's national health service, has had a, a particularly bad time with, uh, with with some sort of uh, direct breaches onto onto uh, contractor systems, but also they were practically taken offline by um, by WannaCry um, as well recently. So it's scary, um, and everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. I won't go into these. I would assume that most of you are familiar with uh, some of these stories. Um, so, HP Gary, familiar with what happened there? Yeah. Um, CEO trying to out Anonymous, and next thing the whole organization gets owned by Anonymous. Quite a, if you haven't read this, the, there is a, um, I'm not sure if I have the link here, but there's, there's quite a good um, flow by blow description of specifically how this all played out. So even you know these so-called security experts can get it very wrong sometimes. Um, so basically, everything that they own, their email server, even the CEO's iPad was was leaked online, and so on. Quite an interesting story. Uh, the other one was hacking team, which is another. Interesting, these are just a few years ago, and uh, I just kind of like the, how these played out. Again, with this one, what was interesting. And I know there's 400 gigs of data, but the, the guy apparently spent three weeks on, on, in their environment before they noticed him. And he, he took out a huge amount of data. And they, they were supposed to be kind of the leading edge security team, and they, they didn't uh, spot him. And again, there's a very good description. I do have it linked here. And um, the guy kind of wrote a, a synopsis on, on all the things that he did while he was, while he was in, within the network. He was writing all sorts of tools and stuff. Uh, he spent time going in and then didn't go in for a few days or a few weeks because he just wanted to see if there was any change in the environment. Then when he showed up again, he realized that they hadn't noticed that he'd been there, so he continued his, his activities. It's quite quite uh, an in-depth description and quite interesting to read through. Um, and security breaches, uh, they're bad for business, apparently. But <laughs> if anybody remembers this one, what I found interesting about this is apparently usage of the website went up after the breach. So this is actually very good publicity for this company, <laughs> believe it or not. So they got breached and, and they were kind of you know, not many people have probably heard about them, but as soon as they made the news with this breach, 
you know, this usage of the service <laughs> spikes. Um, so, yeah. It even was in Mr. Rose. Was it? Well, exactly this reach, like two weeks later, it was in Siri. Excellent. It's a good one. Um, so, yeah, so what's the problem? And I think we've, we've touched on a bunch of different problems. And, um, you know, we all know that software meet, can be written, and it's one of the things that you spend a lot of time talking about is, is secure coding and stuff like that. And, and something that I used to talk about a lot as well. Um, you know, it's, it's often, it, it kind of drives the internet to a great extent. It's on everything. Uh, it's not really designed to, typically hasn't been designed with security in mind, but you and I all, you know, we all know that it, it can be written securely. Um, it's just one of those things that you need to, to be kind of conscious of when you're when you're building applications is, is do it responsibly. Everyone in an organization is responsible for security. Uh, you know, it's not just the security team or the IT team. Uh, weirdly, one of the things that we had pushed back in, in GMI was was on introducing uh, multi-factor authentication that, that freaked people out. It was, you know, my password works. You know, it hasn't. It hasn't caused any issues so far, so why have we got to do all these other, you know, even, even senior guys, C-level guys in the organization were kind of grumbling about having to use an extra factor. And we know it's not perfect, but it, it does add a little bit more control or, you know, introduces a little bit more complexity. So it makes it more difficult for somebody to, to breach a, 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 an access control system or perform authentication or, or you know. Um, but... Uh, yeah, not quite as drastic as this particular one, but um, it's still valuable. Um, and then the other thing, I suppose, which often gets missed is, uh, you know, are you yourself, is your lack of awareness making you sort of an attack vector? Um, we've actually seen this in, in some organizations that I've, that I've worked in, where the execs actually get targeted. Um, and you know, if they're not on their guard or they're not doing things the right way, they they could uh, they could um, expose the organization to some sort of breach uh, inadvertently. Uh, we're coming to the towards the end. I then talk about some kind of common controls. Again, if you're security, if you're well security versed, you probably know most of these things already. They're they're pretty sort of boilerplate. Um, and again, it's going to talk about patch management, log, uh, security management, access control, network segmentation, encryption, backups, asset management. Know what you know where all your assets are. Test a lot. Um, and stuff that you as an individual. So if you're as an as an employee, again, I know you're all very diligent security people, so you're probably doing all this stuff already. Um, but this is kind of, again, very basic. Get familiar with corporate policies, uh, report suspicious activity, alert folks if, if, if strange things happen, use uh, high entropy passwords or passphrases, it seems to be the, uh, the fashion these days, but make them long so they're hard to crack. Uh, harden your, and try and use hardened machines or corporate machines if possible. If you're not secure, if you're not a techie, you know, it's best to, to allow the, the tech guys to, to um, securely for you, but ultimately, for an organization, um, it's really about ma managing risk. Um, and so, I can't remember where I pulled this from, but risk equals threat by vulnerability by cost. I know there's other just companies that build an entire consultancy off the back of doing threat modeling and stuff like that, which I don't do, and it, it, it is very valid, but that's kind of what it boils down to. Um, and that is about it. Yeah. A former, my former boss, also remember saying this to me. Um, you know, if your C suite is a target, your assist, your your exec assistants are probably targets as well. I think he had some bad experiences where his secretary was was being fished and stuff, and a social engineer to to to, re to reveal certain things. Um, but um, yeah, and that's about it. That's that's all for me. Questions, comments, feedback. Useful, not useful. Yeah. Yeah. No? Yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah. 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 You mentioned uh, uh, start from uh, top down. Uh, my experience is it's very hard uh, to do it top down because most of the time my experience is uh, it's 
the top is always looking to the technical people you know, to tell us what to do. And when we sit on our hands, you tell us what the value of your data is or your business process. We say, yeah, we don't know, you're the techies. So yeah. how to cope with that? What's your experience to break the, that? Yeah, it's a good network? question. Um, you often have, have to kind of translate it into business terms for C-level because they all often consider security issues as, as, as a technical problem. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that, and that's kind of hopefully the, the, the premise of what I was trying to do was, was kind of raise awareness, not just at, at a lower level within an organization, but right the way up to the top, and then translate the implications of a breach into you know, financial terms yeah. or commercial terms almost to, to convince the execs that it's something that they need to sponsor, um, but also invest in and push it back down into the organization. But that, yeah, it happens all the time. Okay. It's nice and warm in here. <laughs> Thanks for so together.